DC, the idea of the space, a lot of people will get it and a lot of people won't get it until they come in here. So how are you going to connect with that wider audience who are used to either operating out of their own home or a small little office in an attic somewhere or being in a big organisation in a tiny corner? It's like a big part. I mean, you know, so far the funny thing is we've seen a lot of um, a lot of the people who've come in here have actually come in here because of the, some of the events that have been hosted here. And I mean, I think that's when it comes back to the idea of building a big, a big wide community. The great thing about communities is there's a natural viral effect in them. Like if, if we were here and if all we were selling somebody was a desk and a chair, then every single time you want to sell a desk and a chair, you have, a very, you have to actually go and very heavily sell to the person. Whereas the, the great idea about building it, being very community driven in terms of like the biggest part of our business is actually retaining customers because essentially if you don't like the product after 30 days you can you can you, you can, can leave, leave. Yeah. so the biggest part for us is we have to create an, so much value for our people that they just see that ongoing value and they see their businesses getting better and scaling you know while they're here and like for some we've seen that already in that you know um i suppose we've seen a couple of examples of um, where say more than one person in an industry has come in. So we've had a couple of accountants join us. So we have a couple of solicitors and a couple of graphic designers. And one of the things we do is we let members host community talks where we basically say to them, look, we'll give you a, mem we'll give you a meeting room, come in, use that meeting room, you know, and do a talk on a topic. So for instance, you know, you, you might come in and you might say, I'll do a quick five minute overview on media training for people, you know, get the, get that, interesting you know get them the basics the five things not to do yeah. right so that's one type of member will get that and they'll come in and that's what they'll do and at the end they'll say and oh, by the way if you need any communications work done yeah. come talk to me right how i'll have a coffee up in the lounge with you you'll get another type of member that will come in and they will they'll look at here as somewhere just to get more business so like we found out with a couple of members where it was very much that when they wanted to give a talk to the members, it was purely a sales pitch for what? So it's like this the old notion of, you know, givers get, you know. We think we'll be the sort of business community where people will naturally put into the community because they're constantly getting back out of it. And one of the things that fascinates me about the project is that 10 years ago, this would have been alien. People wouldn't want to associate, say, take the couple of accountants or graphic designers working in the same space, they're all pulling out of the same pot. So therefore the idea of working in the same building as someone else, sometimes that would freak people out, but is it becoming less of a problem? I think it's becoming less of a problem because again, it's, I think it's this big change that's going on. So like the funny thing is, is you know, yeah, I mean, look, we won't stereotype accountants, but because they, <laughs> they, they, they delivered this, yeah. they deliver, our accountants delivered Buckley, our fantastic yeah. sheep to us. But um, the thing is, I think a lot of, I like if you just will stick with accountants, but accountants, their, their jobs are changing as well. So like before, as you said, like five, ten years ago, they all knew what their job was. They all knew what they were selling to customers and therefore they were all fighting tooth and nail against each other for it. Whereas I think, you know, there's so much change going on in the world that you now have accountants who specialize in, you know, one software product. You have accountants who specialize in doing your accounts with another software product. So I think, I think in some cases, I think a lot of the rules are now so, a lot of the rules have vanished. So I think they see, for the guys who are forward thinking enough, they now see the advantage of coming in and engaging. And, and I suppose, it, you know, what we found, like what I found in my, my, my the, the two previous startups I worked in, you found that the, the accountants that you wanted to work with were the guys who gave you that little bit of knowledge. So that you, before you ever signed anything with them, you, they could demonstrate their expertise. And then you knew that these were the guys who understood your business, understood what it was like to be in a growing business. And you know, you'd work along with them. And I guess in the case of both Trustif and Teamwork, the two companies I worked with, for the accountants and lawyers that stuck with them through the journey, you know, there were very big paydays at the end of the process. You, you mentioned startups and look, you've been a big part of two startups. Now you're in the middle of this, your own startup. Is there a risk that this kind of project is only going to appeal to startups or what's the broader appeal of having a co-working space? Yeah, I, I guess there's a natural, like, you know, on a personal level, there was a natural kind of stereotype, it's a terrible word to use, but yeah, there was a natural assumption, I think, for a lot of people that this was going to be a space for startups and it was going to be, you know, it was going to be very technology focused. Yeah, and, and in know? other words, everyone else can jog on, it's nothing yeah, to do with that. Yeah, and everybody, and that has nothing to do with else. 
Whereas, like, we don't, we don't look at, like, we've said from day one, we're industry agnostic and we're also stage agnostic. So we feel that, you know, a, a freelancer getting started will get as much value out of here as potentially, you know, a big company like Microsoft or Nespresso or Bank of Ireland or any of the, 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 the companies that we have working in here. Because it's actually, the funny thing is, is it, it's a bit like, we won't, you know, using the B word, it's a bit like Brexit. It's a challenge for everyone. And innovation going forward is a challenge for everyone. Like whether you're a small business getting started or a big business, all this change is coming. And are you, are you going to see as time goes on, companies taking a little bit of what they have in their HQ or in maybe their, one of their sub offices, lifting it out and putting teams into places like that? Yeah, that's, 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 that's actually, we're actually working on a couple of those contracts at the moment because what, what's actually happening is companies are starting to realize and it, it, this is a big global trend. Like companies are starting to realize that this change, you know, isn't going. To, this change that they need to happen in their in their respective industries isn't going to happen if they just close down internally. Like, you know, somebody said to me recently about if you take something like the insurance industry, um, in the same way that none of the hotel industries saw Airbnb coming because they were like, well, that's not going to be legal, and that's not going to be legal, and that's not going to be legal. The funny thing was the guys in Airbnb. You know, didn't deliberately start off to break laws, but they were they were they were youngsters. Do you know what I mean? They they built something that was very focused on delivering value to their customers, and then it turns out that they were like, oh, okay, so we're actually breaking like statute this and statute that and statute that. And then essentially, but by that stage, they had built such goodwill with their customer base, they could get it, like they could then turn around and say, okay, now we actually need to start charging you travel tax and stuff for this. So it's like the guys who are going to disrupt the insurance industry are not going to be guys who've worked in the insurance industry all their life because those guys, they're naturally going to have those mental blocks against, well, we can't do that because it's regulated and we can't do that because it's regulated. So a lot of big companies are starting to realise that there's a lot of value in opening out the net in terms of, yes, you might have an innovation team in-house in your big multinational, but you know what? There's a whole pile of, of smart people working for your company and maybe what you should be doing is creating a, 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 a network where they feel it's okay to bring forward ideas. And is, is that, look, that's an environmental thing. If you have a team, if you're a big company and you have your innovative team in a corner, is it better having them surrounded by other innovators as opposed to have, surrounding them with internal yeah. people? That's exactly it. Because if, if, they're, if, they're, if they're just kept in their normal environment, you know, no, a, lot of the, a lot of the limiting factors. You know, it's, you know, the funny thing is I find you, you, you know, in a, you go into a lot of big businesses and they'll have, you know, their brainstorming room and they'll have whiteboards and they'll be, they'll be kind of, you know, the first thing they'll be told is, right, you know, nothing is off the table, you know, you just, you know, like think of your ideas and all that. But the very fact that they're, they're just still in the same Well, I'd imagine that that room is probably held for very, holds very boring meetings on the same day. So therefore the innovative nature of yeah, that room is so gone quite Yeah, so they're sitting there quickly. thinking yeah. about the last time that they were in this room. Where, where they, they were talking about the coffee. Yeah. yeah. So I think like when you look worldwide, you see, you see a big trend happening in terms of companies getting involved in what they call, what they term intrapreneurship, which is where they're trying to essentially turn internal employees, get them to think like entrepreneurs. And they're trying to almost, you know, if they want to set up a, a new business division, they try to almost run it like a little startup internally. And I suppose one of the, one of the things that we're well positioned for is that sort of stuff, because if you want to set up a kind of a new business unit, you know, the two things that would be a limiting factor is kind of creating the right environment for them from a from a, a, a thinking point of view. But then as well as that, you physically have to put them somewhere in your office. And like if you've leased your building and or bought your building, you built it for the departments you have, not the ones that you thought you might need. So here, you know, we can basically, we can put a fix, we can say to you, well, if you're going to run an experiment and build a new department for six months, you can build it in here, you'll know exactly what your costs are. They'll be out of, like, Somebody said to me once, and I think it's, I think it's one of the things that we don't give enough credit for is that the w technology has changed one big thing about businesses. The fact that you can be here in Cork and you can work with somebody in Dublin or you can work, and it's the same thing as being in the same building as them. Like we're now so used to messenger apps and email and all that. So therefore you can have a company here in Cork that has, you know, a huge company with a huge real estate presence and they can they can now like have three or four people working in here and they're as connected to them as they were, you know, as they were if they were anywhere else, if they were physically sitting in the main building somewhere. 
this, they could be on a different floor, they could be a different part of the building. They're all communicating. It's all the same. So the world is much smaller and you've got good internet, which yeah, is like one of the big challenges. Really good internet. Yeah. Well, how fast is the internet? We've got gigabit fiber here. So, um, yeah, it's... You know what? It, it's a funny thing. Like the gigabit fiber here was, we were lucky. Um, the guys in Virgin Media essentially preempted the city here, the city centre, becoming a, a big tech hub again. And a couple of years ago, they laid fiber on the entire street here. Um, and it's a big, like actually, just speaking of the street, like that was a big thing for us. Like, if you're going to be, you know, you go to other cities and you see co-working spaces and innovation hubs, and they're, you know, they're in rundown parts of the city. Off they're side down. streets. Yeah. yeah. We knew that the biggest statement that we could make about innovation in Cork would be to put the business on the South Map. As you're because, walking on the South Map. Because yeah. everybody's, every, the mother of every person who works in here is delighted now to be telling that their son or daughter is working in a business on the Mall. But but it, it made a statement that, you know, this wasn't, a, this wasn't a business that was thinking small about stuff. We weren't thinking, should we get a small office somewhere and we'll, we'll scale up? Like, we've 15,500 square foot done here. There's another, there's 25,500 square foot in the building. We're looking at other locations in Cork. We're looking at other locations around the place. As I said, what form they'll take, you know, I, I, I routinely say to people, it's like if you look at Costa Coffee, you know, you have Costa Coffee, then you have Costa Coffee Expresses, you have spars that have Costa Coffee machines. You know, you can take what we want to offer in terms of our vision of the future of work and you can apply it in different pla places at different scales. One of the things that creates that environment is the fact that you come from an entrepreneurial background. You have, you've worked with some of the best that are there. I mean, we're sitting in a space now where some of those guys have come back to give yeah. talks from. Um, and and I, from speaking to you, one of your big things is that there is that access to people who've gone down that road yeah. before. How important is that, that it is passed from one generation of entrepreneurs who are maybe 10, 15 years into it, to the up and coming guys who will make the same mistakes, who will chase the same cats up trees, and who will need the advice if yeah, they're to follow through? You see, that's the, the, what I've realised actually, and this, this is this is this is old age setting in, you know, having turned forty at the start of the year. <laughs> forty, but, you know, forty is the new fifty. I, I, that's I, used, I used to always be that guy who kind of said, "Look, you know, grey hairs be gone." Do you know what I mean? And um, but I realised actually, you know what? That that most businesses are most businesses are eighty percent the same. You know, we. We've built like the, the 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 byline here in Republic of Work is like love your work because that's that says a lot about the sort of people that we want in here because we want people who have a passion about something because that's every successful business in the world is built on the, the founder of that business have being passionate about their core offering not necessarily that they they spot something where there's a huge financial opportunity but that they, there's something they love doing. And you know what? That's probably 20% of the business. That's probably the core product or the core service. 80% of business is still getting your bills paid, paying your bills, raising money for you know various things, managing your cash flow, dealing with employees. All that stuff is the same. So therefore, like that part of your business, you know, that's where the, the previous generation can deliver a ferocious amount of value to people. And yeah, like I've been lucky to work with guys like Pat Phelan and Chris Kennedy and Trustuff and. Peter Coppinger and Dan Mackey and teamwork. And in all of them, like I saw the same thing, which is just like, no matter how busy, the busy, the bill, bigger and busier the business has got, the harder the guys actually worked. You know, as opposed to maybe, you know, people perceiving in the outside that, well, you know, when you make it, it's, you know, you start to just kind of roll off a bit. Like we, um, Dan and Linda Kiley of Voxpro, you know, are, are, are on our board here. Like they've built this massive organization around the world. Everybody kind of sees, you know, them flying around. They're flying around the place because they're opening other offices around the world. Yeah. So all that experience, if you can, you know, like if you can, I, I'm going back to like old school mammyisms now, but the whole like old head on young shoulders thing, I think it's critical. And I think why we built Republic of Work the way we built it with the lounge environment. And as I said, there's a deliberate kind of a design ethos to be cool for, we call it the millennial generation, but not so cool that it's scary for the, the old, the for 40 the, year old the, types. The 40 like year types. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's why, you know, we didn't put in the pool tables and the air hockey tables and all that, where like when somebody would walk in, their instant reaction would be, but isn't this a workplace? But you, not only did you do the good Wi Fi, you also did the good coffee. And there's a good link up with probably the premium coffee brand out there. Yeah, like, you know what? The, the, but you know what? It, it, the funny thing about Nespresso was when we, when we approached Nespresso, first of all, it was a very practical basis. It was. You know, we 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 were all big coffee fans, and at the same time, we were we were looking at it from the point of view: of 
what's going to be easy for people now? Like if we get in these big complicated machines, you know, we'll have this mad effort trying to train people on how to use them and all that. But actually then when we, the funny thing is when we started talking to Nespresso, we realized like that those guys are giant nerds just like they, us. They'd kind of gone through that process already, hadn't they? They had, they? Whole, yeah. they had whole white papers on how the productivity of, you know, how coffee is affected, how your productivity is affected by caffeine. And and you know what is more than that? It was just that the, the funny thing about Nespresso here in Ireland was there was a bit of a startup vibe too because they, they had they had come they were they were a subdivision of a huge office supplies company here and they were kind of making getting their own feet in terms of their own identity their own brand their own salespeople starting to you know when i started dealing with them there was like two guys gordon the, who's now the, the sales director and another guy and now you know like we've we've now got two or three of them working here in the building with us so like that's they're the sort of companies that we love interacting with we love interacting with companies and it's a, it's a big thing for us in terms of who we work with as partners that they're partners who are looking for innovation. You know, Bank of Ireland was the other example, just in terms of, the, you know, Bank of Ireland and, you know, the banks in general go out and they, they slap logos on stuff and they write checks. And, and you know, as somebody said to me once, like they kind of, you know, they, they invest in sports teams, they invest in businesses and everything. Whereas here, it was a totally different thing. Like, I mean, literally, we, we had um, Liam McLaughlin, the, the chief executive of Bank of Ireland Retail, just kind of say, yeah, we want to get into that. And I was kind of, I was all ready to give the really heavy sales pitch, but they're like, we, for, for them as a bank and for every bank, they're, they're facing probably more than any industry, they're facing into this ferocious change where they have this huge amount of real estate around Ireland. They have, they have all these, 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 these procedures and everything and banking products that have been built up over centuries. And now, you know, guys can rock in with apps and disrupt them and stuff. So, you know, they're they're very interested in the future of work and they're very interested in the change that's coming. So they're perfect for us. So, look, you're an early adapter to this model. Yeah. You see the future in this model. But like everything else, it depends on people coming through the door and you convincing people this is the way forward. So what is the 30 second sales pitch? If you have 30 seconds to sell Republic of Work to people, what would it be? I think that at the core of Republic of Work is that we, we believe the future of work is essentially all about expertise and experience. So we think that every business is going to be about how customers experience that business and how, how people demonstrate the expertise that they have in it. And I think to get both of those right, you need, you need, you need access to somewhere like Republic of Work. You need a community where you can kind of test out ideas, you can bounce stuff back and forth. You need to be able to get into a test market somewhere. And I think in terms of expertise, you know, you need, like, one of our big focuses here is on the whole education side of things and upskilling and uptraining people. I think that the businesses of the future, those successful ones, I think they'll be built around those two concepts. And I think we're a space that's uniquely built to deliver on those two propositions. Small but over the 30 seconds. Probably, but I, I, yeah, I'm going to leave it Anybody off. who knows me knows <laughs> that was never going to happen. 30 seconds is too much of a challenge. And look, last thing to you. You've been through... The companies you've been through, you listed them there. They had their ups and downs. You know, some of them started in very small operations. Look at the size of them now, kind of thing. What one bit of advice are you going to give to, you know, the startup, the, the, the company that's maybe two or three years old, the people who have had those sleepless nights or who have a product that's just not there yet and they really want to get it there? What, what would you say to them? I think the one thing I would say is that everybody's been there before, right? So all the companies that you're looking for, that you're looking at for inspiration, they've all been there. And I think if you're if you're working your hardest, right, and if you find the right company, um, I've noticed v over the last five or ten years, and I've definitely taken advantage of it. There's somebody up the line who'll help you. Like there's a like if you, if you're a real entrepreneur, and if you're not a kind of a, as I said, if if you're somebody who's afflicted with the mental illness that is entrepreneurship, I think the challenge is. You will, you'll have, you'll have experienced such pain. You'll help the guy down the road for you. So I saw it in teamwork. I saw it in trust. If we have it here, there's somebody up the line who's a year ahead, two years ahead of us, that we can kind of watch, but that we can actually go and ask them questions. So like in our case, Dogpatch Labs in Dublin, Paddy Walsh, you know, they're two years ahead of us. They've been incredibly valuable in terms of, Paddy, what do you do about toilet paper? Paddy, what do you do about this? What do you do about this? And then by the same thing, there's a kind of an onus on us to look behind us. And like, you know, Ireland's great. It's had a, an explosion of co-working spaces between 
you know, one in Sligo and last week in Dingle and, and in uh, Waterford and Wexford. And like we see that there's a responsibility on us to try and do the same thing. So we're trying to help people down the road. I think for anybody getting into business, don't automatically assume that somebody, because they're in maybe the same space as you, that doesn't mean that you're competitors. And in the same way, you know, that we were talking earlier about the kind of accountants and, you know, them all being the same. Everybody these days is picking their narrow market segments to go after. So like find somebody who's in a space close to you, but not exactly it. And like essentially get a big brother from what is what I'm trying to say. And be brave. And be brave. Don't be afraid to ask them the question. No. I mean, look, the way, the way somebody said to me once about the whole thing was, it's a great time to be an entrepreneur because like, no matter how bad it goes, even if you just do it for a year, like you're never going to, no matter how badly you fail and how much money you owe, you probably still don't owe as much money as somebody who bought a house, you know, in 2008, 2009. Yeah, everyone's problems are relative. Exactly. It's <laughs> yeah. the most important thing. Better to have tried and failed than never to have tried. Exactly. DC, it's great. I know who to blame if the toilet roll here isn't great. That's, yeah. It's yeah. all down to yeah. It's Frank Brennan, our general manager. <laughs> DC Cat. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank